Historians agree that the events that took place in the year 351 MC were a crucial turning point in the formation of the known world. Though the details are still hotly debated, all can acknowledge the profound and unique circumstances the nations found themselves in. But to understand just how incredible the developments of 351 were, we must first understand the history of the known world, its division of territories, and the players amongst its stage. The first division is the provinces of the Tordonian Empire. Imperial history began over 400 years ago in the year 517 TC. King Tobias Medaka III of Tordic saw the need and personal benefits to unifying the surrounding states and kingdoms under a single figurehead. He proclaimed himself Emperor Medaka I, leader of the imperial throne, and thus began year 1 MC of the Tordonian Empire. Madaka I was an ambitious ruler who instilled a policy of expansionism within his council, setting the tone for what the empire would soon become. A power and land hungry entity hell bent on the hostile requisition of any and all territories in the known world. Madaka I had few successes before passing, but his predecessors carried his ideals forward and were victorious in their conquests. Gnosianism is the official religion of the empire, and often used as a way to passively invade neighbouring territories. The head of the church, called the Primus, holds one of the most powerful positions amongst the council. The emperor controls armies and law, but the Primus is the influencer of the people. In year 76, an order of religious knights charged with upholding the doctrines of Gnos were instated. The elite force, known as the Order of the Talon, are under the direct orders of the Primus. Today, the Empire's lands have spread from the edges of the Great Wastes to the Southlands, continuing east to encompass the West Hern Sea and Southern Forest. In the north, they hold lands between Menhedden to the Northern Sea. The history of our second division, the Confederacy of the Eastern Woods, is far more loosely documented. Passed down through the stories of tribal elders from generation to generation, it is difficult to decipher fact from exaggeration and metaphor. In spite of this, there have been efforts to do so, such as the work of Serana Strongwinds, who has researched the subjects on behalf of the Elven Council of Knowledge. From her texts, we can discern the Confederacy was formed as a resistance to the ever-expanding reaches of the Empire. The woodland clans were once disjointed and fiercely territorial over land boundaries. The varied political and religious ideologies were enough to cause hostility, paranoia, racism, and war between them. Segregation was the law of the land. But this mindset was forced to change when the Red Soldiers invaded in year 115. The tribes on the coast of the Hern Sea were massacred, only a few survived by taking refuge in the forests. No longer could the clans afford to remain disbanded. The loss of their sacred lands, the enslavement of their women and children, and the extinction of their people was at stake. A treaty was signed by the three largest tribes, the Skay, the Pyron, and the Kern, uniting them together against their common enemy, and the Confederacy of the Eastern Woods was born. Conflicts between the Empire and the Confederacy continued for hundreds of years, with occasional breaks of peace in between. There have been numerous attempts to reach a truce and put an end to the wars, the most successful being the Two Years Treaty, a dismal failure named for how long it lasted. In recent years, the groups have reached somewhat of a stalemate, only occasionally finding themselves in minor disputes over land boundaries. The territory between the two groups have become heavily disputed zones, making up our third division, known as the Frontier. Settlements in the Frontier are eclectic in their political and religious beliefs, and often remain neutral in times of battle. However, no amount of land, power, or sharpened steel could prepare neither Confederacy nor Empire for the events of year 351. A fatal and mysterious plague swept through the nations, bringing with it more than just mass infection and anguish. From the moment it first appeared, everything changed. 
The earliest cases were traced to Krakenberg, a village near the Southern Pass. Within a matter of days, it managed to spread from the edges of the Spirit Forest to Manhattan in the West. Within weeks, entire populations had become afflicted and succumbed to the disease. Within a year, hundreds of thousands had perished, including two emperors. There was seemingly no end to the death and suffering, as even the greatest scientists and shamans were unable to find a cure or cause. After a couple years, the plague seemed to evolve, and the non-material world began to alter in strange ways. For starters, the lucky few who survived the outbreak occasionally found themselves with the use of magical elemental power. Superstitions caused the new mages to be feared, outcasted, and sometimes executed. Capital punishment, however, was no longer much of a penalty. Death itself had modified, and now, for the most part, seemed to be a temporary affliction. People could pass away twice, even three times or more, before staying put in their graves. But perhaps the most curious anomaly the plague brought was the manifestation of the rifts. Large, bright portals were opening all across the known world, and through them came a new race of beings. They called themselves the Fae, children of the fairy. They varied in appearance, size, and behavior, but were, for the most part, a united front. Some were humanoid with only minor differences in their makeup, such as pointed ears. Others were animalistic in their nature with tusks and horns. The timing of their arrival, coupled with the similarities between their magical abilities and the ones recently developed in some humans, caused tensions to mount. The reigning emperor, Grax of Charcon, had declared the Fae were blasphemous, ungodly, and the cause for the plague. He labelled them hostile invaders, a threat to humanity who must be exterminated. Being non-human was now a crime punishable by enslavement or death. After the eradication of the plague in year 358, the Empire sent emissaries to the many provinces to assess the damage and determine which colonies had survived. When they arrived in Sinsiput, they were surprised to find its capital bustling with activity and life, but not with humans. They discovered Torjadin had been settled by the Fae, who had found it devoid of life after a large majority of Sinsiput had fallen to the plague. Their growing population was living peacefully, governing the city under the same system they had in the mists. But the Emperor's propaganda was strong, and the worst was assumed. Within a fortnight, the emissaries returned with the Imperial Army in tow, ready for battle. They gave the Fae an ultimatum. Surrender Torjadin, and bow to the Empire, and they would be free to return to the Mists, or continue living in the known world as slaves. Refuse, and they would face the steel of the Imperial soldiers. The Fae scoffed at the display of arrogance. Fairy had sent them to the known world to spread their influence, and they intended to do so. And though they had not seen war in many millennia, they were confident, perhaps even a little cavalier in their belief, that they could protect themselves against the uncivilized humans. They would bow to no one. The Empire lay siege to Sinsipat for seven days. The Fae had underestimated the ruthlessness of the Imperial soldiers, and were massacred by the hundreds. Assassins targeted the noble elven families in an attempt to unravel their society at the seams. They were successful in some respects, slaughtering most of the members of House Estelwen, the stewards of Fae culture. The nobles who had managed to escape the assassins hastily organized their houses into a plan of action. House Chthonic, along with Orc and Cairn Prides who had settled outside the city, came to the aid of the rural communities. House Highwell and House Colossus, the Houses of Strength and Prosperity respectively, took charge to defend Torjadin. Highwell's members were trained hunters and applied their tactics against the humans. Colossus, 
providing some of the more cunning members of society became strategists. In spite of the Fae's best efforts, the Imperial Army continued to push into Sinsiput. Their reliance on mana left them at a disadvantage, and their food supply began to dwindle. Their options were becoming less and less favourable by the day, and the pressure to reach an end to the suffering left some suggesting surrender. Back in Tordic, there was resistance against Grax and his attitude towards Fae. The Primus believed the new laws were sacrilegious, and the war was against the ideals of Nos. He sent the Order of the Talon to aid the Fae in their defence and bring an end to the siege. They divided their forces long enough for House Chthonic to return to the city and flank the invaders from the east. The Imperial generals were assassinated, and the Empire withdrew its forces. The battle, for now, had been won. As the blood washed away from the streets of Torjadin, so did the suspicions and fears of the humans. Emperor Grax had passed on, and with him went his archaic views of the Fae. His successor, Madaka IV, had developed the use of magic after the plague, and needed the Fae's help to control them. To return the favour, and to thank them for their support in his claim to the throne, Madaka IV officially relinquished Sinsipat to the control of the noble elven families. They were now free to run their province in whatever way they saw fit, without intervention or threat of invasion. However, Sinsipat still remained imperial land, and, should they ever try to separate, the Emperor promised they would live to regret it.